Good morning. We are the body of Christ. Christ brings together his people from all over and in, from all kinds of backgrounds. The Apostle Paul reminds us there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so we have this great inheritance to look forward to and to celebrate even right now, being God's people, being children of God, and then getting the message out to others as well to become, uh, by faith, the children of God. Let's stand together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, we are, we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care. Stand, uh, remain standing for I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how transformative love at work in the world. Thank you for your great care for all people. And thank you for this chance to declare our praise and our thanksgiving for and worship for who you are. Lord of love, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Please be seated and then join together for a responsive reading that also uh, connects with this love. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. By his mercies, we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. Together, for the Lord does not abandon his people forever. Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion according to the greatness of his unfailing love. And let's sing, Thou art worthy, in response again. inside and outside with our new immortal bodies. Looking forward to that. I hope I am. I hope you are too. Uh, in the meantime, let's continue with singing, I Will Serve Thee. Kind of a song of dedication. And uh, the Gaithers remind us of these great truths. 
of God's grace as we go. And I think we'll probably do this two times, if that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. Just before we sing it again, maybe you have a heart ache uh, at uh, uh, trouble today. Maybe you have broken pieces of your life that you want God to put back together. Maybe you feel like your life is kind of ruined or there's some sections where it might be irredeemable, but that's not the case. God is in the miracle business and he is at work among us and in you and he will uh, answer the prayer of putting our lives in a way that gives him glory. He'll put them back together and he will give indeed life to us. Let's, uh, let's sing this again just a little bit faster. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing for you found me, you have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed transform us. Okay, thank you. That was very good. We're going to go to our prayer and praise time now as junior church is dismissed. And thank you, uh, those of you involved in that important ministry here at our church. Our scripture reading from the Gospel of Matthew comes from Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 48. And as is our custom here, at least this year, I ask you to stand for the reading of the gospel as we read together. Gospel, Matthew 5.43 You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, you may be seated. Thank you. There is really no doubt that we are to love God and to love our neighbor. The whole, really, the whole of the Bible makes it clear and points to this command to love as God's command and as his direction for us. And Jesus makes it very clear in our passage as well. The book of Romans makes it clear that 
Love is the fulfillment of the law. Apostle John makes it clear that everyone who has been born again loves God, loves neighbor. God is love. And as we grow in Christ's likeness, our love too will grow for people. So there really is no escape from this love idea here that uh, we find in our the last part of chapter 5. But there is a bit of a warning as we come to this passage because yeah, this scripture is very easy to misuse. Love your neighbor can be misused in a number of ways, of course, but I don't, you know, we don't want to use it in the wrong way. The Bible can be like a wonderful road map. Uh, maps uh, give us direction which we should go and, and we can get out a map and assure us oh yeah we're we're headed in the right direction uh, going up this way or we're going up this way uh, or we're going down to Florida or we're going out west or whatever maybe and we can compare a map and kind of figure it out and plot out how we should go uh, however uh, scripture and I think scripture is like a map. Uh, however, it can be misused in the wrong way. Our scripture map could be used in a wrong way. And what do I mean by that? Well, on a map or even on a smartphone or GPS, whatever you have, sometimes it looks like you can take shortcuts to get to places that uh, seem not like they're not too very far away in West Virginia. And so, as we zoom in on West Virginia, some of these roads around Princeton, you'd say, oh yeah, I just take this road uh, past uh, Walmart and I can very easily get on over to Virginia. And so, occasionally, you find out that uh, this is what the GPS directs the tractor trailers or the semis to do down, say, for instance, uh, Greasy Ridge Road. <laughs> and they get about 300 yards down the way or so. And that's it. You can't turn the corner without wrecking the truck or wrecking property or all kinds of things. And the GPS says one thing, but the sign says eh, something else. The local conditions uh, have a different direction altogether. And so tractor trailers, large vehicles get stuck, have no place to turn around, and lots of narrow mountain roads are like that around this, not just out there at Walmart. A number of places, and it, it looks like, you know, you can do this, and and then you end up going back and forth and oh, okay, I'm not really making any time. And over the mountains, places that you don't want to be caught in winter in a snowstorm or anything like that going on. Well, uh, hmm. the legalism, let's just cut back to scripture. The legalism of the Pharisees and of the teachers of the law was a misuse of scripture. It wasn't that scripture was wrong, but they were using it in the wrong way. And so with the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the rules start to mount up, like going the wrong place where the map, it looks like you should go, but you really can't do because there's other in directions that are involved here. And so the rules started to mount up with legalism. Do this. Don't do that. Eat these foods. Wear this clothing. Don't do this. Do this. Don't do that. Do that. And so it added and added and added and added. And uh, it goes on and on until the Bible becomes kind of an impossible chore of a list of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations. And they, they just... Uh, it, it continues to be uh, harder and harder. And this is what the uh, Pharisees were doing to people, leading them on 
a road where the, the people weren't supposed to go. Scripture was not supposed to take the semi on that road. And this is what happens when you take love your neighbor and uh, misuse it. And this is what they were doing. And it says, love God and love your neighbor. And that's a fulfillment of the law. Okay, well, that's good. So how are you going to love with all your heart? Well, you're going to try real hard and uh, maybe didn't quite do it hard enough, so I'm going to have to try real hard, a little harder next time. And on and on it goes. And God, we just kind of beat ourselves up over how we have failed to love God or love our neighbor. But Scripture was never intended to do that on a permanent basis. It was always a leading point on beyond that. In this view, where you're headed in the wrong direction toward legalism, then the Bible is misused in a direction where uh, God is portrayed as an impossible taskmaster. You, you, you can never quite be good enough for God to be pleased with you along this road. It's like mountain paths and turns and things. You, you just can't do it if you're a semi. And uh, yet he commands us to love him with all of our hearts. And so we find ourselves down this road in a very difficult position where we're told to love God with all of our heart and we end up seeing God as a taskmaster that we don't want to love. And this is the kind of legalism that the Pharisees were teaching and the teachers of law and still is around today. And I've been trying to emphasize this over this, this chapter 5, to, over these last few weeks, because we don't need to go this awful road. Instead, we've got a better way to go. And so... How were the Pharisees and the teachers getting around this kind of seemingly impossible situation? Well, they offered compromises. Yes, you must love your neighbor, but you may hate your enemy. That's what they were saying. That's not in Scripture. That's what they were saying. That's how they were interpreting this. Opening up the loophole. God hates sin, so therefore God must hate all sinners, too and all, everybody else that doesn't love God. Well, that was wrong type of interpretation. Yes, you must love your neighbor, but um, who is your neighbor after all? Well, let's narrow this down to just a very little thing. And a neighbor, the definition, was to include only the fellow Jewish believers. And Jesus had to tell parables and explain that that wasn't right. The neighbor is much more broader character. But now, on this other hand, the Pharisees were saying uh, that the definition of enemies was expanding to include just about everybody else in the world. And so we have this case study here, as it were, with uh, the misuse of the law. And Jesus has to set the record straight. This is number six. And you've been patient with me as I've kind of set up this all kind of thing. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, were uh, misusing the law, going the way of self-salvation, works righteousness, attempting to be saved by keeping the law, going down a road where they should not go. And the law, and the purpose of the law, is to show us our sin and to cut off every escape so that we'll have to despair and make a U-turn and not go the way of self-salvation and turn in the right way only to Jesus, the only one who could and can save us. So leave that, let's leave that sign behind and let's go the right way now. What did Jesus say as he's setting the record straight? But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's as if he were saying to those that were trying to go down the wrong road of legalism, you thought you could only get away with loving certain people, but I'm telling you the law says you must love everyone perfectly all the time, even your enemies, even the people that are hurting you. 
If you want to really be saved by the law, going down that wrong road, then you're going to have to be a perfect citizen, like we saw last week. Or uh, you're going to have to be perfect in your love to all the world, just as the Heavenly Father is perfectly loving the whole world in every way. And we, we're, you know, we're taken aback by this, and we find out that this is a dead end for us. We can't go this way. And we say, uh, 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 uh. And if we're going to persist in this legalistic road, we we'll just say, oh, I, I have to try harder. I have to try harder and start to beat yourself up more and more and more. And, but that's not, that's not going to do it. Scripture can be misused. Like a good road map can be misused, it put to a bad use, and ignoring the signs that say no large vehicles on this mountain road. The purpose of the law is to show us our sin, not take us to salvation on our own power. Instead, we need to turn around and not get lost on the mountain road of legalism. So I've tried to emphasize that, and now I'm going to talk about other things. We need Jesus. We just need Jesus every moment. You don't get to a point where you say, oh, thanks Jesus for giving that, that boost, now I'll take it from here. No, you don't do that, no. We need Jesus. He tightened the power of the law. Don't just love your friends, love your enemies too. And in your own power, that's a mountain road that you cannot climb on your own. So turn around and just despair and go to Jesus and trust in him. He is the perfect son of God. He is the perfect son of man. And Jesus loves everyone perfectly and completely. He, Jesus had to point out the incomplete and, and imperfect love that the Pharisees were teaching here in verse 46. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? He, are not even the tax collectors doing that? Now, that's just the ordinary way of the world. Even unbelievers love one another in that way. You're not teaching anything special, you Pharisees, and teachers of the law. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? See, the force of the law of love is much greater than the teacher of the law we're telling. In fact, law is, uh, love is what the whole law is about. As uh, one writer, G. Campbell Morning, a British author from early in the last century, this is the way it starts out, this little quote, uh, and he reminds us for the moment, love is the law. It's the rule, the regulation, the principle of life that crowns everything. We go back over this whole chapter, he continues, and you will find it so. If you love, you will never be angry. If you love, you'll never call your brother Raka or fool. You know, we're reviewing kind of chapter 5. If you love, there will be no breakdown of the holy enclosure of marriage relationship. You know, we had that section there on adultery and divorce and things like that. There will be no breakdown of the family circle. If you really love, you'll tell the truth. For a liar cannot love. And Morgan continues, If you love as we have seen, justice will always be satisfied. Love is everything. And so the whole law is fulfilled on the one word, love. And here we go on. Only Jesus loves perfectly. Only Jesus loves completely. And only Jesus kept the law perfectly. And he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so only Jesus is qualified to save us from our sins. And so we can really trust the gospel, which is good news to us, that in spite of our feeble attempts to love God with all of our heart and with all of our mind and all of that, and love our neighbors as ourselves, we find out that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, you know, John 3, 16. The good news is that in spite of our unloving condition of not loving our neighbor or not loving God in the way we should, Romans 5 tells us 
You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we never earn God's love by loving God. He already loves us. We just need to get this truth to sink in here. This love is perfect love. And this is the type of love Jesus has for you. He gave himself for you, even before you started loving him. There's no way that you can earn, you can deserve God's love. Jesus loves you as a gift that he gave himself for you. Just as you have testified earlier in that he gave himself. On the other hand, the outcome of a person that has been born again by faith is a completed kind of love. But it's not through the law. We are saved by faith, and that leads us to love our neighbor by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. Now we are not relying on the power of the law to love, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, we are not saved by loving others. We are not saved by loving others. We love others because we are being saved by Jesus. See how it's, it's put in? A, everything's, now we're going in the right direction. We're not going the wrong way over mountain roads where we don't belong with our semi or tractor trailer. The Holy Spirit is moving you to love. And greater things are possible than hating your enemies. In the new life in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit is directing you. Okay? And the Holy Spirit is moving you to love them and to pray for your enemies. The Holy Spirit is directing you away from apathy, just not caring at all about people. He's, the Holy Spirit's going to move you away from self-centeredness, away from bitterness, away from unforgiveness for those who have hurt you. He's going to move you away from prejudice and from selective love. Kind of love oh, only, I, I love those of my kind only. No, I can only trust those that are kind of like me. He's going to move us away from that kind of selective love or love only for certain types of people. In Christ Jesus, the way is open for a completed type of love for all kinds of people. And that's the force of the passage which says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Don't fall back in the tra trap of legalism, seeing this sentence as, Oh, oh, I've got to be uh, sinless. This is not about being perfect, sinless in behavior or perfectionist or never doing anything wrong. This is in context. It's about having a completed type of love, just as the Heavenly Father loves all people. This is not about being uh, perfectly sinless, although that one day will be our future at the last day. But Jesus says that God the Father causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he doesn't withhold sunshine from unbelievers. He doesn't withhold rain. He gives good things to both good people and to the bad people. It's a complete type of love. His gifts of love, sunshine, rain, life itself, come to all kinds of people, and he's perfect in love, a complete kind of love with a wide scope for all kinds of people. That's the direction of the Holy Spirit in your life. To have a fully developed, rounded out type of love for all kinds of people that may not look like you, may not have the same interests as you, may not talk the way you do, may not even have the same language as you. How are you going to do that? Try real hard? No, 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 not back to legalism. It's a miracle. It's a miracle.
by the power of the Holy Spirit in you. There's a miracle. God's supernatural love is at work in you. You are becoming God's agent of love into an unlovely world. This is a supernatural thing going on. Can you really love someone that has hurt you and caused and inflicted all kinds of pain on you? God's supernatural love in you and in your life can bring forth a miracle. It's not you, it's God within you. And his salvation and his forgiveness for you can transform you so that you can actually pray for those that have hurt you. And you can actually seek in prayer their general and good welfare of those that have hurt you. Not just praying that they're going to stop hurting you, and not, ju not just seeking that that persecution will stop, but that you're really seeking God to bless those that have been your enemies. How do you do that? Well, God is in the miracle business of doing something incredible in your life. Instead of holding on to a grudge against those who persecute you or harm you, God's going to transform you to forgive them and to love them. And how's he going to do that? Scripture says through prayer. You pray. You pray for those that have hurt you or persecuted you. And God's going to transform you to forgive them and love them. And he's going to do it through prayer. Now, this is not an instant process. So you have to be patient in prayer and persistent in prayer. It may take a long time, and that's okay. That's okay. It may take a lot of tears. It may be a painful kind of prayer and experience, but God is in the miracle business to help you love people, even the people that hurt you terribly. It may not mean restoration in every case, because things are not going to be the same as they were. It, it will not pretend that things haven't changed. There will be a new situation, but it will be a miracle for your healing. And we're people of hope and healing. It will be a miracle of your healing so that you can love again and take the risk to love others. Love is a risky type of thing. Love from God goes into us, through us, and has no place for revenge. It has trust in God. And we don't love based on our feelings. No, no. Love for our enemies is going to be a miracle of completed love from Jesus, where we love regardless of our feelings, regardless of how the other people are going to treat us, regardless of what people may think, whether positive or negative about that. We love because we are becoming God's children. And that's a miracle. You are a child of God. And that's a miracle. What should we do? Well, commit. Commit to acknowledging your hurt. It's okay. Commit to it. And go to God in prayer and commit those hurts to the Lord Jesus. Don't retreat into apathy or being just, oh, I guess this is the way it's going to be. I'll just have to, I just have to have a cold heart now. I've been hurt too much. I can't, I'm, I'm not going to trust anybody anymore. Just go into the ice box. No, you're not going to do that. Don't ignore people either. Uh, it's too painful out in the world. I can't possibly love them. I might get hurt. I'm just going to ignore them. No. And just don't camp out with the pain either. You know, pain is useful for getting our attention, but the pain doesn't have to be so painful all the time. Pray to God about those heart hurts and heartaches. And start praying for your enemies. And you can start out small, but start praying and you'll stop hating them. may take time. That's okay. 
but you're going to discover there's a miracle in progress in your own life. Jesus' love is going to be at work in you, and you'll be able to gradually pray for more things, and the hate will disappear. The Holy Spirit will lead you into the miracle that you can have love, Jesus' kind of love, that kind of quality of love for all people, because you're a child of God. You're becoming a child of God, healing, and you're becoming one day with a completed type of perfect love, even as your heavenly Father is perfect in his love. Let's pray about it. Let's go to prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We've sung about our hurts and heartaches, but now maybe it's time just for us to cast off that load of hurt feelings or harm that has been done in the past. And just not carry that burden anymore. We don't need to. We want your miracle of forgiveness in our lives. We want to have a complete kind of love. Because after all, that love is a powerful, powerful witness in a world that is increasingly becoming cold in its love. We want you to be at work in us. We don't want to hold on to the ice box and the ice cubes and have a Grinch type of heart. We want to have a love that expands for all kinds of people. We may be facing some people or some painful situations right now. Now we're going to cast those cares upon you and ask, Lord, that you make a beginning in that healing in some areas that maybe we even just not, not deal with. Just not have, it's too painful. Now it's going to be all right because you've provided a direction. You're going to give a miracle in our lives. We're asking for that miracle that we can forgive. We're going to ask now, Lord. We pray. Uh, all right, we're going to ask. I'm not going to look, Lord, but maybe there's someone that just needs to raise up their hand to you. No one's going to look around. And just raise that hand, and, and that's going to be a sign to you, Lord, that they're willing to take the adventure of casting their hurt to you, casting their cares. No one's looking around, but you might just want to do that. Lord, people are asking for, they're asking for your healing of their hearts. I don't want to hold on to the bitterness anymore. Do a work in us as a body that we might also be healed to love again, to trust your healing process. Bring your comfort and your Holy Spirit to warm those hearts that have been cold. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, time to stand and sing our final song before we go out to worship, uh, go out to praise the Lord. Let's uh, worship Him one more time and dedicate ourselves uh, to being God's people, a servant song. And I'm told that this is kind of a new one for you, but I don't think it's too hard. Uh, and it goes back to 1977, called the Servant Song. We are pilgrims on a journey. Servant song. We are pilgrims on a journey. We're together on this road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of
Thank you.